Hello and welcome to another conversation with myself, Mark Vernon and Rupert Sheldrake. Hi there, Rupert. Hello, Mark. We meet and talk about things that have been on our minds, maybe researching, maybe reading, and just see where the conversation will go. Very much to encourage thoughts, even conversations um, with those who listen in as well. So I hope it's useful. And Rupert, today you've suggested that we talk about the notion of extended mind. So this is the proposal that what goes on in our inner lives, our thoughts and feelings, isn't just to do with what's going on inside our heads, but is actually because in some way or another, we participate in wider fields of exchange of um, maybe even, you know, the divine mind at some level. But let's not rush ahead because there's a very particular reason why you suggested we talk about this today. Um, not going as far as the divine mind. Um, I just want to talk about what happens when we see something. Um, because oddly enough, the nature of vision is not at all understood. It's been discussed for at least 2,500 years since ancient Greece. And it turns out it's profoundly mysterious. Just me seeing you now on the screen is utterly unexplained. And I look out of my window to tree, that's unexplained. Um, and the reason is that the official theory of vision in science since the year 1604, um, when Kepler published his theory of retinal images, the theory has been that light comes into the eyes when you see something, you get inverted images on the retina, which is what Kepler showed. It was a brilliant discovery. Then we now know impulses go up the optic nerves and changes happen in various regions of the brain. All that is known in more detail than ever before. But now comes the mysterious bit. Where does my image of you appear? I'm seeing you on a screen in full color. I'm looking around this room. It's in 3D full color. Um, I'm looking out across to some houses two or three hundred yards away. Um, all those images spread out in space, according to the official theory, are supposed to be inside my head. The brain is supposed to generate a kind of 3D full color representation of the external world as a kind of controlled hallucination, to use the words of Anil Seth, the neuroscientist. Um, so that's the official theory. And does it really make sense? Um, the, the more traditional theory, which is believed by virtually everybody all over the world in all traditional cultures, and surveys show believed by most people in our own culture, uh, despite the official theory, the, the traditional theory is that light comes in, changes happen in the brain. Everyone agrees about that. But but then images are projected out. So my image of the tree, as I look at it now, is where the tree is. It's not inside my head. It's projected out through my eyes to where the tree is. And this theory actually is even taught in schools, despite the official theory, in relation to mirrors. So when I look at something in a mirror, um, what happens is that my outward projection goes straight through the mirror, being virtual or in the mind. It's not reflected like the light. So the light's reflected by the mirror, but my uh, uh, image is projected straight through. So even according to physics textbooks, I'm seeing virtual images behind the mirror. Those are my projections. So first of all, that's theory of vision, the, the uh, it is the extended mind is extended in every act of visual perception. And this is something I've discussed in a recent paper with my colleague, Dr. Alex Gomez Marin, um, in this paper called The Nature of Visual Perception. Could a long standing debate be resolved empirically? And I've just published this new paper, which has just come out in the Journal of Scientific Exploration, which is called directional scopesthesia and its implications for theories of vision maybe uh, just to leap in there and say for readers we'll put these details in the in the notes um so if you want yes, to so that anyone who's interested there, yeah anyone who's interested can look at the actual papers this is co-authored with my colleague pam smart now 
scopesthesia is the sense of being stared at, which most people have experienced. You feel you're being looked at from behind. You turn around, there's someone looking at you. Um, or you look at someone and they turn around and look back at you. About 95% of people have had that experience. Now, the reason I think it's relevant to these theories of visual perception is that if our images are all inside our brain um, and nowhere else, it shouldn't make any difference whether we're looking at something or not. It won't affect them because it's all in the head and it's insulated inside the bone of the skull. And there's no possible influence can go out. And the official view among many scientists is that because it's all inside the head, the feeling of being stared at is impossible. Therefore, even though most people claim they've experienced it, they haven't really. Uh, they're wrong about their own experience. It doesn't exist. It's an illusion, a superstition, and it's an illusion caused by just looking around all the time and occasionally someone's looking at your eye, uh, looking at you. So it's a kind of coincidence and then you forget all the times you're wrong. That's the <laughs> official theory. Um, but in fact, um, I've done a great deal of research on it, which shows that, first of all, it's a real phenomenon. And this new paper that's just published looks at 960 case studies of uh, the sense of being stared at and shows that in almost every case it's directional. People don't just vaguely feel uneasy and look around to see if someone's looking at them. Um, they turn and look straight at the person who's looking at them. We've done online surveys as well that show that most people have had the experience. We already know that. But those who've had it, um, 85 to 90 percent or even 93 percent um, say that it's directional. They remember it as being directional. And you could say that when I do service on my website, I've got a bias sample. And I also asked Deepak Chopra to do it on his website. He's a holistic doctor. Maybe he has a bias sample. And so I thought I'd check by asking Professor Chris French, who's one of the top skeptics in Britain, as you know, former editor of The Skeptic magazine, a frequent speaker in Skeptics in the Pub, uh, the skeptical commentator on many ra radio and television programs. I, I asked him to run a survey on his uh, social media, which is mainly made up of skeptics, and got exactly the same results. Even skeptics have experienced this and experience it directionally. Uh, he did put in his survey, however it might be explained, what is your experience? We didn't want to get into the theory, but just had they actually experienced it. So here we have a remarkable thing that the, the official theory says it's all in the head. Our actual direct experience is of images being outside ourselves. The uh, world mind is spread out every time we look at something. And if we look at a distant star, there's a sense in which our mind reaches out as far as that star. Um, so, um, and the, uh, the proof, I think, that it's not just inside the brain is that looking at something can affect it. Looking at another person can affect them. And the same happens with animals. If you look at animals, they turn and look straight back. Or if animals look at you, people turn and look straight at the animal. About a third of the cases that we discuss in our paper on directional scopesthesia with anim are with animals. So really, what's, that's the point I wanted to bring up, that our minds are extended beyond our brains, even on the most everyday, simple basis that experienced by animals as well as people. Nothing mysterious about vision. We all take it for granted. And yet, it seems to me to show uh, directly that our minds are not confined to the inside of our heads. It's very fascinating. Um, and my mind's going in a number of different directions. But I'll tell you what, just to pick up on that comment you made there about stars. Um, what what's the sense then of what's happening then because in some ways when the distance um between yourself and an animal or another person is effectively zero because of the speed of light um they're close enough um you know that sort of sense of reaching out being touched and so on um you know makes some sense it's it is that it's the same theory with um the light from stars does that count in the same way well, I think it does. I think that when we reach, when our mind, when we look at a star, our sense, in a sense, our mind reaches out to touch it. And because the star may be, say, 
10 light years away. Um, if the mind reaches out to touch it, you could say that it takes 10 years before it touches the star, uh, if it's 10 light years away, if our outward projection goes out at the speed of light. But an alternative possibility um, is that our outward projections are in a sense the opposite of light. They go in the opposite direction to light and maybe at the opposite direction in time, uh, from the future towards the past, as opposed from the past towards the future, which is the normal direction of travel with light and indeed of most physical causation. Um, and this then leads us into something that, I mean, you went straight for the star, which actually leads, has the most theoretical implications precisely because of the distance in time as well as space. And you, you remember that um, we've probably discussed this, that Alfred North Whitehead thought that mental causation as opposed to physical causation works in the opposite direction in time. Physical causation works from the past towards the present and towards the future. Whereas mental causation, he thought, works from the virtual future towards the past. In other words, our minds are full of possibilities of possible things that we could do uh, in the future. Um, we, one of the functions of consciousness is to choose between alternative possible actions. And as soon as we made a decision, you, we make it happen. But mental causation, his idea of the relation of mind and body is not the usual one of the minds inside, the bodies outside. So we talk about the inner life, we use these special metaphors, but rather that the mind is working from the future towards the past and the past, the physical causations working from the past towards the future, they overlap in the present. Now, if mental causation is working from the future to the past, then maybe the what's happening in vision is that light rays, visual rays, the rays of vision, are not only going in the opposite direction to the light, but from in the opposite direction in time. And that would mean that our minds are reaching out with this peculiar feature of moving from the future towards the past or from the present towards the past in the case of vision. Um, the, 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 this is happening all the time, every time we see something, something that's kind of mind boggling and mind expanding, literally, and amazing, it might be going on every time we look at something. So that um, notion would make sense with a traditional notion of the divine mind, um, because I don't know, certainly in, in classical theism, um, the idea would be, well, Plato's phrase sums it up, that time is the moving image of eternity. So in the eternal realm, call it the divine mind, uh, everything is fully actualized. And one of the names of God in the medieval period was actus purus, everything's actualized. And what we're experiencing, therefore, in time could be would this be right? Could that be interpreted through Whitehead's particular understanding that time then is um, these two um, direct, you know, modes of travel, if you like, meeting in the present? Yes, I would. Uh, I think it could. And you see, I think that one of the interesting things is that reverse movement in time is actually built into some aspects of physics. In even in classical physics, you know, Maxwell's equations for light as an electromagnetic radiation, um, you know, they, they under, underlie our whole understanding of light, X-rays, ultraviolet, you know, everything to do with electromagnetic radiation. His equations for light give two solutions. If you work out the equation with a plus sign and a minus sign and called the advanced and the retarded wave. And the, the um, physicists agree that light could move either way according to these equations um, and, and in opposite directions in time. Uh, but what they do is say, oh, well, it's only the one from the past towards the future that's physical. Um, that's physics. It's real. Uh, the other one, we'll just forget about it. So it's there in the equations, but uh, it's exactly half of what the theory of light is but it's simply discarded. Now, you see, 
this again, since you brought in the divine mind, I was planning to stick just to <laughs> sort of ordinary mundane vision. But um, yeah, since one of the things that we see in many traditions is God is light. Um, in fact, in the Eastern Orthodox tradition, God's often spoken of as uncreated light, the light of light itself. Um, so if God is light, then it means that the light has this two way flow. And in so far as God is the light of the world and all these metaphors about God um, and light would mean that actually uh, divine causation could easily be working through light in the opposite direction to physical causation, that um, God's mind could be in so far as God's mind interacts with the world. Um, it, it could be that God's knowledge of what's going on happens through the electromagnetic field. Um, how does God send, if God's omniscient, how does God know what's happening? You could say it's just a miracle beyond our comprehension. Or you could say, as Sir Isaac Newton did, uh, that there might be a medium for this. And in Newton's case, he thought that absolute space in which everything happens, he believed that space was absolute, uh, precisely because he thought absolute space was the sense organ of God, the sensorium of God. So everything happens in space, you know, planets move, the stones fall, you know, everything's had bodies move, we have bodies, we have gravitational uh, force and stuff as we sit on our seats and whatnot. Um, all of this is happening in space. And if space is the sense organ of God, God would literally know where everything is and how fast it's moving and what's going on. That would tell the basic thing about bodies, where they are, but there's much more to nature than just bodies. I mean, you and I weigh something, but there's more to us than just our weight. And our thoughts are closely associated with electromagnetic patterns in our brains. Our vision is associated with light and so on. Uh, and so it could be that, um, you know, that the, the light, the, that for God, if, if the electromagnetic field of the whole universe is also a sense organ through which God knows not just where things are, which he knows from the gravitational field, but their colors, their shapes, their patterns, the order and, and the beauty of flowers, the form of, of a hedgehog, uh, all these things, f f forms, and what the Hindus call names and forms, which are names of patterns of activity in minds, which are also electrical with their interface with the physical, that um, the divine mind might have the electromagnetic field as its sense organ or one of its sense organs. It's worth mentioning probably that A.M. Whitehead was a great mathematician. And in fact, some said he is one of the few people that understood Einstein's theories, you know, which we're alluding to. Um, directly uh, or indirectly here, um, particularly when it comes to um, uh, the, the the wider application of the idea that time can travel backwards as well as forwards, because I believe that is in um, the quantum theory as well um, as the electromagnetic theory when those two things were um, synthesized. So did Whitehead, was Whitehead not just, as it were, seeing parallels in physics and then in his philosophical proposal but was he actually working on the basis that those two were joined up i don't know and he not only understood einstein's theory of gravitation he had a theory of his own um and i'm not mathematical enough to understand it but um he so he actually put forward a well worked out mathematical theory of gravitation it would be interesting to know whether it included causation from the future. Actually, I myself think gravitation does involve causation from the future. Um, I mean, it, the, the Einstein block universe, which is the standard theory, um, has past and future is symmetrical in gravitation um, and it's kind of geometrical explanation. But if you think about gravitation in terms of what it's doing, a gravitational force is a pull. So, now, if I hold something um, and drop it, a sheet of uh, paper like this, and I drop it, it's pulled towards the ground. So there's a pull, and a pull is usually from the future. It's from the, it's being pulled towards being on the ground, which is in the future when it starts falling. 
So I think gravitation itself is a pull from the future. And my own, you're sort of, I'd hoped, as I say, we we're just going to be talking about vision, but here we are. We're now on to the ultimate uh, fate of the universe because personally, I, because of my theory of morphic resonance, memory and nature, I think gravity is a kind of memory. Everything was originally a primal unity, according to the Big Bang theory. Everything started, the universe was very small, it was completely unified. And then the Big Bang blew everything apart with dark energy, which is still making everything expand faster and faster. Um, but the countervailing force is gravity, which is pulling things back together again. Until 1999, it was generally believed that the um, universe contained so much matter, including dark matter, that it would stop expanding, it would slow down expanding, and then it would begin to contract and it would contract faster and faster till it all ended in the opposite of the Big Bang called the Big Crunch, a kind of black hole where everything would be pulled back together into a final unity. And so I see gravitation as a kind of memory of primal unity, which is trying to pull everything back together into a final unity, teleologically pulling from the future, as it were. It's opposed by dark energy, which is pushing things apart. And at the moment, cosmologists think that dark energy is stronger than gravity, so the universe is continuing to expand. Um, uh, but nevertheless, I think one can actually think of gravity as an attractive force working from the future. Um, it's not the way physics is usually conceived of, because in the 17th century, the idea of pulling from the future was abolished in physics. In the Middle Ages, people took it for granted as a causal factor in nature. Yeah, teleology um, and so on. But I think moving backwards in time, you see, which I think um, is happening with the outward flow of vision and uh, the causation with the opposite direction of light, is, as you mentioned, also possible in quantum theory. According to Richard Feynman, the, the great exponent of, of quantum physics, um, you can think of quantum particles as moving forwards or backwards in time. And an, a positron, which is a positively charged electron, according to Feynman, is an electron moving backwards in time. It's opposite. In every way, it has an opposite charge. It has the same mass, but it has an opposite charge and an opposite flow in, in time. So it's moving from the future towards the past. So... <laughs> Uh, it's not alien to the spirit of quantum physics to have movements in both directions. Yes, and and um, I mean I, I don't understand it fully the gravitational theory of general relativity myself either. When I did a physics undergraduate degree, we didn't go near it, which uh, shows you how complicated it is. But nonetheless, the sort of one o one notion of gravity actually is that it's a movement through space time. Um, so that's uh, you know perhaps not a million miles away from from what you're suggesting too mm. um, that that's how gravity is now understood can i let me throw in another sort of direction of travel and see whether how this connects up because what also was um striking me about the notion of um you know uh our extended mind and and how that plays into vision is i think there's good evidence that what we see very much depends on the mind that we're using to do the seeing. And this might be an individual thing, but I think also it's a cultural thing and varies over time. Um, so every so often you read these extraordinary reports of Westerners, often missionaries, who went to visit remote tribes, say in the Amazon jungle. And one of the things that's reported is that the people in the tribe often collectively seem to be seeing something that the missionary just couldn't see at all, often, say, spirits or um, local gods. Um, and the extraordinary thing is that the tribes would, or the people would look, as it were, as one towards this thing that the missionary couldn't see. And I've always been very taken by that idea, because I think also in the past, um, our ancestors, maybe in different times and places, too, could perceive things that we, at least most of us now, struggle to see. 
Um, I've got on to this through the work of Owen Barfield, the inkling friend of C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien. Um, and of course, Tolkien takes this up because in the Lords of the Rings, the different consciousnesses represented by his different creatures, like the elves and the dwarves and so on, one of the features that distinguishes them is that they see different things, even though they're ostensibly in the same place. Um, and you get quite hard evidence for this in language even. And the, the little factoid, which I find endlessly fascinating, is that the ancient Greeks, say in Homer, didn't have a word for blue. And you think of those one word you need when you live in the Mediterranean with blue seas and blue skies around you is the word blue. And yet Homer describes the sea quite famously as the dark red wine sea. And it seems that um, the texture of things matters to people far more than their kind of electromagnetic colour, um, which does to us now. And so there's a sense in which um, all the assumptions, and in the modern world, of course, a lot of those are scientific assumptions, materialist assumptions, directly influence what we see, which then carries at least some sort of resonance with this idea that the looking out matters quite as much as what is taken in. The um, great geometer Euclid, when he came up with his theory of mirror image, uh, virtual projecting out so into the mirrors, so the virtual image behind the mirror, very much emphasis, emphasized the active nature of vision. One of his examples about 300 BC, which is when he was writing, um, was if you're looking for a pin that's fallen onto the floor, you know, where, as soon as you see the pin, although the light coming into your eye is the same before and after you've found the pin, uh, your interpretation and what you're seeing changes. And of course, with visual illusions and hallucinations, what you're seeing um, is not what's actually there. Um, and there are lots of optical illusions where, uh, which suggest that we're projecting out it's our mind that's projecting out what we interpret. And uh, in India, there's a very famous example of this, since they think that everything's projected out as Maya, you know, all our perceptions, all the experience of the world is in a sense, a projection, um, magical projection. Um, one of their favorite examples is you're walking along in the dusk, and you see a coiled snake on the path in front of you and you startle back and you're scared and you're really worried about it. And then you look again, and you realize it's just a bit of old rope coiled up. Um, and so your reactions are completely different. The light coming into the eye is the same in both cases, but what you make of it and what you project out is different. Um, so the, I think that's one of the, this is actually absolutely standard modern theory. Anil Seth, whose book Being You uh, was a you know, bestseller a year or two ago, um, is a really a materialist theory of the mind. He's a materialist neuroscientist. Uh, but he says that our perceptions are controlled hallucinations, that we're projecting out what we expect to see, uh, their expectations, as it were. Um, it's not what's actually there. So this general, this view is actually now pretty mainstream, even within materialist neuroscience, that we're not seeing what's really there. It's a kind of outward projection, although he thinks we project it and somehow it stops when it gets to the bone of the skull. There are a few neuroscientists saying, well, why stop if it's a hallucination, if it's virtual, why has it got to stop at the skull? Why can't it extend out into the world around us? which is similar to what I'm saying, but they think of it as being an untestable theory because it's just virtual and therefore it can't actually do anything. Whereas what I'm suggesting is that it's not just virtual, it can do something, it can affect other people or other things or animals that we look at, which is why the sense of being stared at or scoposthesia happens. And so uh, I think all of this, you see all these, point towards this outward projection um, theory of vision. And does is there a medium for this as well, then, um, in in the way that you understand it? Um, you know, it's, it's maybe not a physical medium, so there's not disturbance or there's not things traveling through it in the physical sense, um, like, a, like a photon. And but nonetheless, is there a, a medium that carries um, the sense of being um, stared at? 
Well, I think there must be a medium because whatever it is, it's directional. And the interesting thing about directional scopesthesia is that people who are stared at detect the direction. They turn around and look straight at it. We don't know how they detect the direction. This is totally not understood. But they couldn't detect the direction unless there was some kind of medium in which it was traveling. And the simplest hypothesis that the medium which is traveling is the opposite of the light, that it's a kind of, here's the light going one way, and there's a kind of reverse flow in the opposite direction to the light. That the opposite of a photon might be a visi-on, you know, the, uh, 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 a wave of vision. Um, that the, It may be that the, the light, the electromagnetic field itself, it has these two directions all the time as Maxwell's equations suggest, um, and as some of quantum theory suggests. Um, so it's the light itself which is the medium. And what happens when you look in a mirror is that the mirror acts like a beam splitter. Um, it, uh, you know, in physics, you can have beam splitters that let something go through and other things don't. And, and the, the mirror reflects the light part of the uh, of, of this, but it doesn't reflect the outward projected images because those go straight through the mirror, which is why you see things behind the mirror. So if one thinks of mirrors or lenses as beam splitters, um, then it is possible to separate out the projected image from the light itself, but normally they function together. And I think it's always worth remembering in these conversations that, you know, I happily talk about photons as if that's something that's fully understood, you know, an object, a particle. Um, but if you ask a physicist, you know, but what is a photon? Um, they will say, we don't really know. It's just uh, a sort of useful fiction in a way that um, fits into the equations that can make predictions and can describe physical systems and so on. There's no doubt about that. But just what they're describing and just what these entities supposedly are pointing to um, is not at all clear, actually. And I, I feel that's often worth bearing in mind because in a way that's the sort of um, the blurred ground where the supposed physicality of the photon kind of disappears. Um, and then these other possibilities, which are more mental, um, can connect with um, things like Maxwell's equations. There is, you might say, I don't know whether this is, makes sense to you as a way of putting it, but there is a kind of um, a bit of a no man's land, you might say, where what we think of as two separate modes of existence, the physical and the mental, actually meet. Well, I think they do through vision, you see, and I, I, I think this is where we can most directly see their meeting, you know, when, whenever we look at anything, or especially when we look at something in a mirror, where we actually split the light and, and the projection. And yes, I mean, the photons, there's a description of photons um, in physics, which explains some aspects of their nature, but it doesn't explain vision. Um, uh, because that's left to physiologists or psychologists to explain vision. And they can't explain it because they just take the physical theory of light coming to the eye and inverted images on the retina. That's where physics leaves off. And, and it passes the baton to psychology or physiology. But they're so enslaved by the idea that it's all got to be nothing but physics in the end, um, that the idea that there could be a reverse flow along uh, the photons could actually be two-way processes um, is, is not considered. As a matter of fact, one interpretation of quantum theory is physics by Kramer. I don't know if you know Kramer's transactional interpretation. No, I don't actually, no. Oh, well, Kramer, C-R-A-M-E-R, -E um, has the idea that um, when I look at, say, the moon, um, the photon of light comes from the moon and falls on my eye. And at the moment that photon's absorbed in my eye, there's a reverse particle, the opposite of a photon, as it were, an antiphoton or a, a vision or whatever you call it, uh, which moves in the opposite direction and is absorbed by the very atom that emitted the light in the first place, uh, but it moves backwards in time. And so he thinks that the quantum process, when the, the, the photon leaves the moon and hits my eye, and the opposite of the photon leaves my eye and goes to the moon, the, the two processes are simultaneous. Um, and 
uh, that it, that's why it's called the transactional interpretation. There's what he calls like a handshake between the two. It's a two-way process, not a one-way process. Um, and so I think that that interpretation fits rather well with all the things we've been discussing. And that already exists as a valid interpretation of quantum theory. It's not the majority one, obviously, but um, it's very relevant to this discussion. So just another angle to throw in here, which is on my mind at the minute, which is the thoughts of William Blake on vision, in fact, on the senses. And, and interestingly, actually, given what you were just saying there, Blake intuited that touch might be the most spiritual of the senses, which is kind of interesting because you might think that sight or hearing um, would be because they seem to be more ethereal. But actually, Blake was very keen on touch. Um, he often has feet in his images because he feels that's the place where we participate, um, or at least a symbolically touch shows the direct participation that we have with everything else around us, a bit like that transactional interpretation there. But Blake too, um, he is very clear that, well, as he puts it, um, when you and I look outside a window, we don't look at the glass and sort of ponder the quality of the glass and whether it's clean or not, whether there's any bubbles in it or not, the size of the pane and so on. We look quite spontaneously through the glass to that which is not just the surface image of the glass, but which is transmitted by the glass. Um, we look through it, um, we look with it um, and through it. And um, he thinks that that's a very important way of understanding our sight in general. Um, he says, you know, you, you know more look at the eye when you see with the eye then you look at the glass when you see through the window and again i think he's keen on this because he was very clear that the kind of mentality that you take to the act of seeing directly shows um directly affects what shows up and one of his pithy little sayings is that um you know the, the wise man sees not the same tree as the fool does um, and then he glosses it and says, you know, the fool just sees an object in the way, you know, whereas the wise person sees a living creature um, sharing in the divine imagination. Um, and, and again, I don't I don't think he means these things metaphorically, actually, or I don't think he he he, he saw things in this way because he was on some kind of psychedelic trip. Um, I think that he was perhaps born with this capacity. He also lived in the 18th century um, when the science was well underway. The mod modern science was well under the underway. Um, Newton was, you know, widely celebrated and so on. But it culturally, um, there was still a much greater mix of various ways of seeing the world. Um, and so I think one of the things that Blake realized was that older ways of seeing were in a, what does he put it, a mental fight with new ways of seeing. And in particular, he got very exercised about how a lot of these um, sort of useful fictions, um, these uh, uh, qu quantities, um, light, momentum, mass, even like light, actually, in, in a in a corpuscular sense, um, were showing themselves to be very useful in terms of developing the science. But he feared that what was just useful, what was just method, was becoming an ontology, was becoming a new interpretation of reality. Um, and to the exclusion, I mean, we would call it now the sort of reductive view or the materialist view or the mechanical view. Um, but anyway, a bit of a ramble from me, but, but Blake, I think, holds out the hope that not only are there different interpretations of understanding sight, but actually we can work on what we see. And um, because we have this kind of active relationship to sight, it's not just a passive reception of photons that then some sort of mechanical process makes sense of and um, but that actually you know what we take to sight matters i don't know whether whether that even is reflected in any of your research well it was more or less it seems to me what we've been talking about all along that there's an active projection of what we interpret or what we see that is that sight involves it's not just like coming in and passively interpreting it it seems that blake's saying the same thing um, and I suppose we should finish soon because we've gone longer than we usually do. But uh, I'd like to just bring in one further point actually triggered by your talking about Blake, uh, which is that in the Upanishads, in the, particularly in the Kena Upanishad, 
there's a wonderful saying um, which I ponder quite a lot. It says, not that which is seen by the eye, but that whereby the eye can see. Know that alone to be uh, Brahman, the Lord. Um, so there's the idea that vision is it's not that which we see, but that the, the ability to see itself, which is this divine gift that it's the, it, in a sense, it implies that vision itself is part of the divine mind. And the, as the Hindus think, uh, our minds are kind of fractile derivatives of the ultimate mind. Um, and vision is, is therefore part of this gift of consciousness or ability to see. Um, which is distinct from what we see. It's a different kind of thing from what we see. Um, and again, you see, that would fit very well with this idea of this active nature of vision and also the way that it's intimately linked to light, but in a sense working in the opposite direction. That's very beautiful. I mean, it immediately reminds me of a well-known saying of Meister Eichhardt, actually, which is the eye which with which I see God is the the uh, the same eye that God sees me, um, and then he talks about you know sight and knowledge and awareness and so on, all being one. There's a sense in which it is all one, um, and I guess what the 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 saying in the Upanishad there is inviting us to reflect on is not, um, you might say the um, the incident of seeing, but the quality of seeing itself, um, and then that then also makes a lot of sense of the way that light is used in these different contexts. Um, you know, there's the light which in one account physically reaches me, but then there's the light that enlightens uh, my inner perception of things. And then, of course, there's enlightenment. And then, as you mentioned right at the beginning, there's um, the way that the metaphor of light seems to apply so powerfully to the divine life, the divine presence as well. Um, so I guess that, you know, another way of putting what we've been saying, and we're all to close now perhaps, is even held in the words themselves language remembers these things which you know your work and others is trying to explicate too um so look, thank you very much that, that was very fascinating um a long journey um through the cosmos uh through time backwards and forwards but um if people are interested obviously do look at the papers but thanks very much rupert that was really tremendous well thank you mark